Um, I'd like to call the planning board meeting of December 15th to order. We have a quorum. It is 6.34 p.m. It is 6.34 p.m. I did not have to You're notate fine. that. Uh, do I also have to notate who's on? So we've got John Jones, Kent is on, Michael Lavelle, Melinda is on. Um, is that everyone? And then I, Kelly Cates, I'm here. And so we're just missing. Um, first things first, uh, we'll need a motion to allow um, Vice Chair Kelly to preside over the meeting. And if not, good luck, kids. I move to let, I move for that. Yes, to let Kelly, the Vice Chair, preside over the meeting. So I moved, okay. So we need a second. Seconded. Seconded by Mike. And, and Mark has joined the meeting now. All right, Mark is on. Mark is on. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. present now. Apologize, folks. You're fine. Welcome. Thank you. All right. So, am I approved to continue? You are. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, wait. Was there a vote? Yes. Oh wait. There needs to be a oh, vote. Oh, there needs to be a vote. That's right. <laughs> God. Austin, come on, man. I gotta step up my game. <laughs> okay. So, further discussion. Uh, any further discussion? Nope. All in, favor. All in favor. Okay, yeah. Right, unanimous. unanimous. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. All right, um, now we're moving on to adoption of the agenda. Does anyone have any comments or changes? Damn, I just broke my pen. <laughs> no comments or changes? I do not. Rohit, are you good? Uh, yes, I'm good. All right, so. Um, could someone make a motion to adopt the agenda? John Jones, raising his hand to make a motion. Second the motion. Any yeah. comments? Who was the second? All, John, John Jones <laughs> made the motion. Mark Peterson okay. seconded. Cool. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you. Uh, next, did everyone have a chance to look at the meeting minutes from 1117? All right, any changes or comments on Austin's note-taking? <laughs> any judgments? No? Okay. Uh, could I get a motion to adopt the meeting minutes for November 17th? So moved. Uh, second. Melinda seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. And moving on. And then you can sign these later. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, is there anyone online that, how do you do public comment online? Uh, I'll, I'll you, go you look just, at this. You just ask if anybody would like, okay. would like to speak. They have three minutes. Okay. Anyone signed up over there? Probably not. Nope. Yeah, there's nobody All here, right. so that's, that's an easy job on our end. Um, anyone who's joining us on webex um if you have any public comments would you please speak up and uh let us know that you want to say something and if you do you've got three minutes in front of the planning board to clarify um if you are in attendance because you have an item on the agenda duh, this is not the time this is just for any general public comments all right we're good. Moving on. Mm -hmm. All right. Discussion of Marvin Gardens welcome signage. All right. Um, so I've put this item as uh, basically I think uh, the developer uh, Asa Harris uh, is in the WebEx audience and he'll basically be presenting this. Uh, but I'll just uh, give a short introduction where this is uh, a concept. So this is a basically like a pre-application meeting. Uh, to pitch the idea that um, in front of the public, in the, in the very front of the development at the corner of Newtown and Providence, there's um, an idea that we would have a sort of a sign that would say, uh, Publix welcomes you to Village Marvin, you know, because uh, we can kind of uh, improve this branding and, and kind of let people know that they're in Marvin. Um, so I'll leave it at that and I'll ask um, Austin if you could. Um, if you could screen share the uh, the schematics so that everyone on um, everyone who's viewing can see it too. 
Oh, I need to pull up. Um, the, let me pull up the packet really fast. I apologize. Yeah, no problem. Um, in the meantime, um, I did put Asa as uh, the uh, speaker, so he can. I guess he can go ahead and speak. Fantastic. Thanks, nice Rohit. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, you're good. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, appreciate uh, the introduction, Rohit, and um, all your assistance throughout the, the process of getting the uh, Marvin Gardens development completed over there. Uh, we were really excited to get it open about two months ago. And uh, right before, actually it was the day prior to opening, uh, uh, some of the members of council uh, uh, came by to take a tour along with uh, Rohit, and um, we had a, a good bit of folks from Publix there as well. And one of the topics of conversation that came up was um, I think everyone was really happy with the appearance of the development, um, the overall aesthetics, and um, we've heard a lot of good feedback, um, the people that were pleased with, with how it turned out. But one thing that, uh, that came up was the fact that, you know, it kind of lacks a, a presence from the intersection. Um, also, you know, the, the fact that, you know, the development home diagonal across the intersection is not in the village of Marvin, and obviously this development is, um, you know, it's kind of a, a key differentiator. Now, eventually the out parcels are going to be developed. And that corner, uh, right on top of where that pond wall is, actually is designated for, uh, I believe what was notated in the original zoning as a signature building. Um, but in discussion, we started batting around, is there something we could do at the intersection to bring some more presence at the intersection um, and introduce the overall development, also to notate that it's in Marvin, and the idea of a gateway sign was was developed. Um, based on that, we developed the concept. If you could go to the, so this is the, what you see on the screen currently is the intersection, and obviously uh, our development is on the southeast corner of the intersection. And there's a retention pond. I'm sure you've probably all been by it uh, at this point. Um, the sign location we're talking about is right uh, at the intersection on the back side of the sidewalk. And if you could possibly go to the next page, um, and roughly this is this is what it would look like. It would be constructed similar to the other signs on site with that stack stone. Um, it's the same stack stone that's also on the wall, uh, the retaining wall there, and on the Publix building, and would simply say, Publix welcomes you to the village of Marvin. It would be an unlit sign, um, and it would be diagonally across the intersection from, there's already a sign across the intersection that's similar, um, being a, uh, a, a sign that is facing the intersection for the development that's at the uh, northeast, excuse me, northwest corner of the intersection. So our goal here was to, you know, really notate that uh, obviously we thought we could do something that would give public a presence and also welcome people to the village of Marvin, given the fact that this is kind of the, the gateway in or one of the, you know, the northeastern um, portion of the village. Um, so that being said, you know, from there, we really wanted to get everyone's comments and feedback before we go forward with an official um, application um, to modify the, the zoning to allow this type of a, a gateway signage feature. Um, Again, it is not planned to be illuminated. It's not planned to have any uh, changeable copy on it, anything like that. It's planned to be, you know, this is what you see is, is, is the sign without any real, there will be no latitude to modify it or anything like that or change it over time. Um, so that being said, I'll turn it over to, I guess, Rogan or uh, members of the planning board. Hey, so do you have, um, this will differ from the pylon sign. Um, do you have, uh, is the pylon sign also done by you guys? The pylon sign is, is already been constructed and we're using the same sign company uh, that did those pylon signs to, to do this. Um, so if you, if you go by the development and you see the pylon signs are already in, the ones that are in are all there are. There's no additional signage that's allowed under the zoning. Um, other than what you already see there. 
um, other than the signage that's actually physically on the buildings that will be built. Um, so when the out parcels are developed, there's not freestanding signs allowed on the out parcels. And um, uh, this would be the, the only additional sign that's not what you see out there today. So. Were all tenants included, all existing tenants included on that pylon? Um, it has space for... It has space for tenants. I believe four tenants. I have to pull that up real quick. Um, but it's only, no, only a handful of tenants will be on that sign. It's, it probably extends. So not everybody will be on there? No, no. There, there, there's simply not room. The original zoning limited it to how many tenant uh, panels there could be, and I believe either three or four how did they get chosen who did, how did the three or four get chosen they get chosen through the, the leasing process honestly it's um it's whoever uh is probably going to be some of the more key signature users either out parcel users or, or larger tenants in line um so it's similar to what you see in a lot of developments where you know you'll see it may be a large shopping center or a large development but there's only a handful of the larger tenants uh, or retailers that are on the sign so okay thank you yeah absolutely uh, this is john <clears throat> you know and you know i like the idea of a uh, <clears throat> you know welcome to marvin sign uh, but obviously the you know the village of marvin is is hardly visible in this sign whereas Publix is very visible as far as the, the font and the, and the lettering. Yeah, absolutely. We'd be more than happy to explore changing the copy. I think the copy is the village's standard. I believe they use the village standard font um, and they use public standard font. So yeah, just by na the nature of the two, they're very, very different. But you're also right that the height of the two is not the same either. Um, but we'd be more than happy to, to explore changing that. Yeah, I, I went back to the uh, letterhead from the agenda, and I think on the on, on the letterhead of our uh, package, it's it's basically all uppercase letters and, and bold. Okay. You know, the font may be the same, but it's and Rowhead or Austin can probably address that better than me. I, I just did a quick you know back to the letterhead to see what, what we used. And they're different sizes. Well, I would say that our uh, font that we use on our letterhead and our website and such um, wasn't designed to be on roadway signs. So, I, and I don't even think we really have a an official um, like graphical theme. So, I think it wouldn't be too much of a stress to say let's use a different font for this sign that stands out better. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at actually the emblem that's on here, you can't see it very well, but if you zoom in, the Village of Marvin is on the emblem that's, you know, kind of projects up higher than the rest of the sign. You know, maybe we could mirror that. I think, honestly, that would work well. It's all capital. It appears to be a little bolder. Um, we could match that, plus it would be consistent, you know, within the individual sign. Yeah. You know, and like I said, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with the concept of just you know the first you know visual of it you know that struck me you know i like the, i like our uh, village seal being added on there that mm -hmm. that adds something to it absolutely yeah thank you thank you for the feedback and we can certainly modify it to, uh, i think to uh, i think it's a, it's a good comment we can address that i i personally think with the correct font that it looks good Is there a reason that um, the two fonts are different sizes? So we had this graphic generated by our sign vendor and it was not specifically, we didn't direct them to make the two different sizes. I think they laid it out and this is just what they came back with. Um, I think we could certainly, I think we can go back and we'll, we'll analyze that and see uh, what it looks like if we were to make the two letters the same height. And uh, when we come come back, we can certainly kind of address that further.
you know, throw an additional comment in, in pulling up to the intersection, you know, the, the, the existing stone walls, you know, around the detention pond, you know, are, are attractive, but you almost lose, you know, right up there next to the sidewalk because that, that wall is down low and everything carries you back past it. So this would bring everything, you know, I think a little closer to the, to the people. So this isn't connected to anything. So I actually have not uh, been by and seen the wall around the retention pond yet. So is this just a standalone? Yeah, there's a fence that goes around the retention pond. And if you if you go out there, and I apologize, we really should have included a photo as part of the package. Um, but there's a fence that goes around the retention pond, and basically what would happen is this will either sit right directly in front of the fence, or we'll actually physically remove a section of fence, and it'll sit there. Um, before the store opened, there was actually a, a Publix Now Hiring sign um, that was mounted on the fence, and it's going to be in the same location as that if you possibly uh, install that sign. So, so the, um, the wall to the right with the two-foot uh, dimensions, but is that just an example of the thickness or is that actually That's part of... That's an example of how exactly how thick okay. it would be. Um, so it, it's, it's proposed to be this 20 feet long uh, with that four foot projection of the 20 feet uh, that has the village emblem on it, the remainder of it that has public welcome to you to the village of Marvin, it's the 16 foot, and then it's two foot in width. So that's kind of like a side view. Great, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Rohib, are we voting on something or just discussing this? Uh, this is really a pre-application type of uh, meeting where we engage their willingness to consider this because the process of allowing the sign would actually be a zoning text amendment. Um, because this is a conditional district, um, every sign and everything that was allowed was already decided and they'd have to go through that process to allow the so before, you know, putting the you know, developer through that whole process, you know, that's why we're here to gain your will. So uh, maybe not a maybe not a vote would be required now, but a consensus that you know. Rohit, can you speak a little more into the microphone? Sure, sure. How's that? There you go. Yeah. So maybe a consensus that this would be willing, you know, that the planning board would be willing to see this. I tell you what, I'd like to see. I mean, I know about where the sign is, Asa, but I mean, I'd like to see kind of an elevation from the from 16, or maybe sit, sitting on Marvin Road. You know, where most of the people from Marvin are coming um, down Newtown Road, actually not Marvin, but down Newtown Road. See what it looks like um, from that. If you can get an elevation, if that's possible to produce an elevation from there. Absolutely. I think we could actually probably have it superimposed on a, an right. image from the intersection that really will give everyone a good idea. Um, I think that'll help you in your process. I really do. I think, you know, people see that and it's like, yeah, that looks great. I think yeah. that'd be very helpful. Yeah. Hey, I think it would give some scale to the whole thing. You know, uh, cause a lot of people have, you know, and I'm not speaking for other people, but I would say a lot of people have a difficulty in visualizing, you know, how large or how small something may be until they see it, you know, inside, on site kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And back to, I guess, Michael, your question, Rohit, this would be similar to our, our 7-Eleven uh, application uh, earlier, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And is this and just for clarity, just to make sure, Asa, a 7-Eleven is not on the pylon, correct? That is correct. Yep, no tenants. No, no tenants on the pylon. Oh, no tenants. Oh, what, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Which pylon? I apologize. You're talking about the ones that are already installed? Yeah. You know, I am not sure if they are planning to be on that or not. I honestly cannot answer that. Oh. Is this um, is this something the developer will maintain and um, 
you know, if a, if a if a letter falls off, like is this is this going to be the developer's responsibility? Is it property management? I'm not exactly sure. Are you? Yeah, that is that is correct. So this actually this development is owned by Publix. Um, so this sign, like the other signs in the shopping center, will be maintained and owned by Publix. Um, so ongoing maintenance will be by them. I mean, I, I like what I see. I, I, like I said, I'd like to see a, just a different elevation, but, you know, I have no problem um, if they came in front of us um, supporting something like this. That would be my take. I guess maybe Kelly could call for just a show of hands as, you know, uh, you know does it look, you know, the, the concept look good enough to to proceed to the next step. I'm not trying to take, you know, tell you what to do, Kelly. <laughs> John, you're so bossy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I actually can't see everyone, so. Um, Let me, I can, I can bring everybody back up. So once Austin uh, stops sharing or either gets. No, I can, I can still share. I just have to pull everybody back up. Actually, no, I actually have to stop sharing. <laughs> One second. Uh, I, I personally think it does look good enough to take the next step, with again, with the corrected font. Okay. Okay, and I have to pull everybody back up. All right, could I just see a show of hands from the planning board if you are encouraged, encouraging them to move forward? All right. Looks like... Um, you guys are good to good to go. So make if you could work on making those adjustments to the font and the font sizes, um, as well as maybe get some pictures with the superimposed from Newtown Road. I think that would just strengthen your your submission. Absolutely. Thank you very much for everyone's uh, feedback and input. Really, it's helpful in, in determining how to go forward in the process. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch uh, to follow up procedurally. Uh, so. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Good night. So you're move on to the next slide. All right. So now we're moving on to discussion of conditional use permit application 20 12548, pulled in the side yard at 1901 Grig Lane. Rohit. Excellent. Um, so this is a pool in a side yard. Um, the way the house is oriented, it's kind of on the corner, um, and I'd say on the ground it feels like it's their rear yard, but on paper it is in their side yard, and it's adjacent to their neighbor at, uh, I believe it's like 1905 Great Lane. Um, so the, the ordinance states um, any pool can be located in a side yard by right if it's at least 150 feet from the side yard property line and if it's any less than 150 feet from the side and 200 feet from the front then it requires a conditional use permit so um, it doesn't really state a minimum there um, just that if it's less than 150 feet it requires a conditional use permit so uh, the application does have it at 16 or so feet from the side yard and 50 something feet from the uh, front yard um, and uh, I, I, I really didn't uh, advise them to change that to 20 because, I mean, 16 is not, I mean, 16 is smaller than what we normally allow for pools in the rear yard. It has to be 20 feet from the side yard, but uh, I mean, I, I didn't advise them to change that because it could be considered to be allowed if you wanted it to, uh, depending on this conversation. So um, with that, I would like to say that I do believe the applicant um, is in the WebEx audience today, um, and uh, I think that's uh, Mr. Ferris. And uh, if uh, before I, you know, give the floor to him, if he wants to talk, um, if you want to talk, would you say so? And then we can get uh, the planning board's uh, consensus to let you have the floor. Sure, Rohit. This is Matt. I'm here. Uh, Ken McKee, 
is here also with Superior Pools. Uh, I'm the homeowner. He's being contacted to build the pool. Great. So would uh, would uh, the planning board uh, please uh, give a consensus for the two of these gentlemen to uh, speak in the agenda item? Okay. That's unanimous. Okay. All right. So I think I'm up. Yes. yes. Looks good. Yes, yes. All right. We had the um, pool design up there a moment ago, but I don't see it. What I'd like to do, if I could, share, share um, Google Earth and take the screen share from you, if that's appropriate. So I think it'll give people an understanding of kind of the way that the property's laid out. Is that okay? Actually, um, Austin will share his screen. We have um, all those pictures and renderings in our packet, so you just give us a second. And, uh, yeah, I think I think it'd be better um, if Austin were to pull up the Google Earth. Okay, that's fine. One second. Um, when, when he gets when he gets that up again, I think it'll give everyone an understanding of how the neighborhood is designed. Like Rohit mentioned, that my house is on the corner and it's kind of positioned toward the intersection of the, of the corner of where the two streets uh, intersect in the neighborhood. So by definition, it makes it my backyard. Um, the neighbor's house who I back up into the Harpers, they, we brought them along for this journey. So I've been in North Carolina for about four years and have since decided to build this pool. And, um, you know, we've shared the plans with them. We have uh, put together this, what, what is kind of the skeleton of a landscaping plan to share with them. Uh, but it, it's really a commitment. Um, they've, they've been very good neighbors and very accommodating my family since we've been here. It, it's really a commitment to them to do what's right from a, a landscaping and a privacy perspective. They haven't expressed any concerns uh, up to this point and they actually signed off. We, we went ahead and took the papers to them and shared the, the plan with them and they, they were more than willing to sign off and we've, we've submitted that. Um, their house is the one down here to the bottom um, of the screen. The, the interesting thing for me going through this process, uh, I didn't know this was my side yard um, met, be, before we went through this, so it's kind of been a, a, a learning lesson, but um, there's other pools in the neighborhood where the, the, the configuration is pretty much the same, but I guess it's technically their backyards, so the requirements have been different. Um, if you were to move Google Earth over a little bit to the other side of the street, it's a very similar um, a, a very similar setup so that house 8501 they don't have a, a pool in this picture of google um, earth but they do now they put one in a year or two ago and um, you can see I, I guess that's technically their backyard uh, but it's very similar and and they have since put a pool in there and there's a, a few i won't bore you with it but there's a few other neighbor um, houses in the neighborhood that are very similar to, to that story there so um, anything else you'd like to hear um, I'm open. Ken's here. Ken wants to add anything. Like I shared with Rohit really before, when we designed this, we kind of thought it would need to be 10 foot from the line because I, I didn't, honestly didn't know this was my um, side yard at the time. So it, uh, we want to get the pool put in. Um, I got three kids that would love to have it with, with everything going on in the world these days. Uh, but I'm not tied to <laughs> the, the actual design. Um, so if there's something that you all would like changed, we'd be glad to uh, massage it a little bit. To, yeah, make it what we improved. Um, Rohit? Are we muted? No. Yes, hello. There Sorry, you go. Okay. Um, what is, so if he, what is the, is it, is it 50 feet from the pool edge to the neighbor's yard for a side? Um, okay, so. There's, there's two things going on here. There's when, uh, when a person applies for a CUP to put the pool in the side yard, there is actually no minimum um, the way that it's stated in the ordinance. Um, so you could, you could approve something, you know, this is 16 feet, you could approve that. Um, but you said but for, like, for rear, right, it's, for it's a, 20? Right, for a pool that is located in the rear yard, it has to be 20 feet from the side. Okay. 
I still and think this also, is um, this is a to, an, to address another couple of questions that the uh, applicant had. You know, your your address is 1901 Grave Lane, and the, the neighbor uh, is going to be 1905 Grave Lane. So that's how that makes that your side yard. Um, and then another point is that we do, in any case, even for normal pools, require 90% screening of uh, using evergreen trees or wall or fence or something else. Uh, usually people do uh, go with evergreen trees, so we would make you do that as well in any case. Yeah, and that would be perfectly acceptable. From a landscaping perspective, um, I'm going to do what you all require to get it approved. I'm going to do what the Harpers desire. Um, if it's an addition to that to make them pleased again, I, when I moved down here, I, I traveled after my job and my wife was at home with kids and they, they accommodated her and made her dinner and, and took her in to really help her. So I, I'm going to do what, you know, I'm, I'm committed to, to them to make this right for them as well. Um, it, it's hard to see here, but the, there are trees and bushes that line, the, the rear and then the left hand side of the yard. It, it needs a little work because you can see through pockets of that so we would put up some additional landscaping there uh, and then on the right hand side um, we would need to have some considerations there where it's open to my yard you can go up on the street and um, you can look into my side yard backyards and side yard there from uh, Royster Run from the road there um, and, and we would want to take care of that either way for our own privacy the, the last thing I didn't mention that I would add is on the back side of the pool, which would be um, on the, the side of the Harper's house, we're planning to put a wall that's, um, can help me with the exact details, but I think it's 18 inches to two feet in height. That would, it, it would be a structure on the pool, but it would help with the privacy if you were able to see through any bushes. It's basically it's just an exposed wall of the pool and the landscaping between the side yard property line and the pool, you would not be able to see through that at all. With what the parish is planning on doing as far as the landscaping goes. All right. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I was actually wondering yeah. why why there was no concrete back there to extend the, the pad, but now that makes sense as to why. Um, Rohit, if we were to ask for a standard of 20 feet, like in a rear, a rear yard setback, I mean, do you, would you, they even have, would they even have the additional, I guess you, they'd have the additional four feet to move the pole just closer to the house and maybe readjust the, the deck. So, if, if you're looking at 1901, uh, we're calling it the side property, but the sidewalk that comes from his driveway comes around to his back porch. That sidewalk is coming out. We are pulling that sidewalk out, and we're redoing the pool decking around that. If we have to pull that, within 20 feet, there's no way he's going to be able to put the pool there at all. Just because of the landscaping that needs to go in along the side property line between 1901 and 1905. Um, I understand what you're saying, I'm just not sure I'm just saying, could could the pool itself move four feet towards the house? Yeah, I think that if we lifted the pool up as it's designed and moved it four feet to the house, there would probably be safety concerns that it would be too close and you wouldn't want someone falling in. Um, so I think as it's designed, the answer to that question would be no. Um, I, but I'm not, if that was a requirement, I'm not sure you couldn't come up with a solution where a different design could be, could be taken into consideration. The, the other thought I had around that, because that road hit and I communicated a little bit on email and, and I knew the 20 feet was in consideration. And um, 
you know, if, if you did move it, right, then you may consider putting the concrete pad on the the far side of the pool as well by the neighbor's home. And then if you did, right, because otherwise you'd have that useless land there. If you did that, then you probably want to have the wall. Um, so it's, uh, you know, if you were to, to take that approach where you moved it, didn't put the wall in, the wall I think is 18 inches wide, so you could buy, you know, you could buy, you could move it a foot, you could buy 18 inches with the wall, you can make the pool a foot skinnier, and there's three and a half, right? Um, but then if you didn't have the wall there, it might, um, I don't know, it might be worse for the Harpers. And Kelly, can I ask what your concern is about 16 versus 20 if the neighbors are, are okay with it? Uh, I just, just for cons some sort of consistency with our but other I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exception we're having to make. Each exception usually is, has its own characteristics. Just asking questions. No, I, I don't know. I was, I was just wondering why we would have them redesign the pool. I didn't know if there was another thought about that four feet that made it less palatable to you that I was not um, picking up on. I don't have to be critical. I just was kidding. No, I don't. I'm just trying to be trying to ask questions to be consistent with other things. So just, you know, we have to also look okay. at what happened. I do you have know. one. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I do have one comment to make, which is that 20 feet, we, the dimension that we use is from the water's edge. So when you are doing that little calculation, you don't include the depth of the wall. Um, you can you count it from the water's edge. So if you wanted to adjust it that way, you might have that 20 feet. Or at least get close enough. So I tracked, I tracked a portion of that comment that you measure from the water's edge. When, we, when we're measuring 16 feet right now, Ken, is that measuring to the water's edge or is that measuring to the start of the pool, the start of the wall? That is water edge there. Okay. Yes. We we do everything in water's edge as well. Okay. So it's it's me that was misinterpreting that. Thanks. So I mean it you know, I think with what Matt Ferris uh is planning on doing with his landscaping, I think we can hide this pool in both the side and the front yard. From, from any potential neighbors. Uh, even if, if we need to readjust some of the curvature on the back of the pool to bring it in somewhat, uh, we do have room to swing the pool around towards Greg Lane a little bit more and be able to recontour the back of the pool to, to give us a couple more feet. If that makes sense. Why is this, this? Oh, this is a different pool. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, uh, there, to change the uh, no, the, the focus of the conversation, but you know the uh, the raised wall. So. In essence, the, 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 the water surface is going to be higher than the existing grade uh, adjoining the neighbors, as I understand it. So what would be the finish, exposed finish of that wall that the, you know, if the neighbors could see through the, the, the plantings? The, uh, the raised wall was 18 inches above the pool elevation. What are the materials being used, uh, the outside finishing? There'll be a stone veneer. Uh, yes. So it'd be a, a, an architectural stone finish on it. Veneer finish. It'll be, natural, it'll be natural stone. It'll be a, uh, a Tennessee filled stone, uh, grouted. Uh, we'll have. Uh, Probably open on the top, the whole bowl numbers. And the stone veneer will be around the spa also. Okay. 
So the spa elevation is going to be 18 inches above the pool. And then the well will start with a spa and a wrap around towards the deep of the pool. How is this considered their side door? I don't understand. It's behind their house. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm getting into trying to touch on some of the things we touched on previously is, you know, the, the landscaping requirements and then they'll have to be totally fenced all the way around. Correct, Rovia? Correct. It, it is fenced. I don't think my fence will be up to code because there's a bar that you could climb on. Um, we've had those discussions, so we would. It's um, uh, maybe the put their house is considered where their driveway it. is. Um, no final About, decision there. because of the, because their address is Greg Lane, so that automatically just yeah, makes up their side yard. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Thank uh, you. Uh, mm -hmm. Final building inspectors. So yeah, the pool will be enclosed with inside of fence. I didn't add, um, so I don't want to make sure it's assumed. We did go through the HOA approval on this, and the HOA has approved it already. And uh, you have the letter from Jan, the next door neighbor, mm -hmm. at uh, 1905. Yeah, I do, and we sent that over to Roadhead, so he should have it as well. It, it, it is in the packet. So does one of us need to make a motion? So I think there are two conversations happening here. One was to either allow the people at signed or um, ask that the applicant uh, or recommend approval contingent on the applicant uh, giving at least 20 feet of um, setback. I personally would make a motion to approve as presented based on the fact the HOA is approved that the neighbors in agreement and that uh, happens to be one of those properties you see fairly often these meetings where the side yard is in, in a classic sense of what most people perceive to be a side yard is sort of one of those unusual situations that it just generally you know, at the neighborhood in my opinion as well as uh, the direct neighbors so I would move to accept this proposed I would second that Rohit, would we need to alter the motion to make sure that we saw a landscaping plan with evergreens, additional plantings? I think we have a motion that's been that's been offered in second, correct? The, the, your motion, motions can still be amended at this point. Okay. If 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 requested, but it would be a sec it would be a second motion. I mean, if we approved it like this, technically, well, I guess the Ro Rohit, uh, as it stands, if this is approved, is does this is the is all proper screening required in in what's been shown here? Right, the landscaping uh, the landscaping is separate. Uh, like we would still require the minimum landscaping, which is ninety percent screening um and i would make sure that they have a landscaping plan before um the gets okay i think okay so that, right should, should we should the should the do you do you think the motion should be amended to include that condition as your staff you can, you can amend them i think you can amend the motion just to you know cover all the bases you could just amend the motion to add uh contingent on receiving a landscape plan a compliant landscape plan or something Mark, would you mind amending? I, I move to amend my motion as suggested by uh, Kelly. Uh, Mark, uh, just for the record, the motion uh, you would, you would actually need to say what the motion is. So you want to you, you move to amend the the motion to include the uh, the required screening. 
If, if, if I move to amend the motion to include the wording, which reaffirms that all the required screening will also be built with the pool as okay. presented to us. Perfect. Thank you. That works. And now I need a second. Mike, you still want a second? I couldn't get to my unmute button quick enough. Yeah, I'll second that. Sorry. <laughs> we waited. It's fine. Yeah, I raised my hand. I hope that you. I can't. We can't see you. Oh yeah, we're still screen sharing. Oh okay. Let me take that off so we can get a good vote here. There we go. That's what I did. Okay. All right. So you're good to take a vote. So uh, all in favor of the motion on the table. All right. Approved. Good luck, Mr. Harris. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, and on your time and consideration and helping through this, the one question I have, and then I can be finished, is um, for landscaping plan, we need to turn in something formally. Is that correct? Yes, you'll need to uh, show uh, basically where you're picking trees and you know the spacing type of trees. Um, and if you want, I can send you some sample that are in the past for other pools. Um, but it, it's simply just a survey showing where you put the trees. That would be awesome if you could. I appreciate that. Thank you all. Thank you. Good luck with your pool. <laughs> all right. Moving on. Moving on to the next conditional use. Permit application 20-12554, pool and rear yard that abuts side yard at 2028 Groves Edge Lane. Okay, so this is another uh, pool and a rear yard that abuts the side yard. Um, and it's uh, fairly similar to a lot of the ones we've seen in the past. Um, but in this case, Something interesting is that there is a pool on the other side of the street in the exact same situation. Um, two or three years ago, they uh, did get a conditional use permit and it was approved then. Um, so, um, let's see. Yes, Austin, uh, if you could zoom in on that. Excellent. So, so you see they do have the landscaping. Um, looks to be uh, let's see, 71 feet from the rear yard, the, the, the property line that abuts that side yard, um, and then 42 feet from one side and um, 86 feet, 78, something, some, somewhere around 80 feet from this street. Um, so, I mean, I think we've, we've approved pools with less setbacks than this in the past. I'm not entirely sure if the applicant is on the call today, um, but I would like it if Austin, if you could uh, go to a Google Earth of this property so I can sh uh, so we can see the uh, the other property in question and, and you know kind of the relationship between this property and the the property that uh, is abutting their side yard. Oh, and uh, there's, I think, one call-in user. If you are the applicant, uh, please uh, speak up at any time if you want to uh, request to speak. Could you Austin, do you have the uh, Google Maps pulled up? Yes. Oh, and I'm sharing the wrong thing. I apologize. I yeah, need to yeah, change my you're screen. Sharing, you're sharing the PDF, not the screen. Yeah, just one second. Yes, thanks. Is that, is that, oh, oh, hold on. I, I think I switched the wrong thing. Can you see the, uh, see the map? Yes, yes, that's it. Thanks. Right, cool. Um, could you zoom out just a bit? Maybe a, a scroll or two. Yeah, there. So, so you'll see now the, the rear yard. Um, is in the back, um, and the side yard, the house in the side yard in question is on um, Red Tree Court. So it's pretty far. Um, and then you'll also see across Red Twig Court, there is a house on Grove's Edge Lane, 
who is also rear yard abuts the side yard on Red Twig Court. You see the one with the pool already built? That all also had a CUP. That was approved in 2017 or so, um, and it's very similar to um, the pool that is being proposed by this applicant here. So at this point, I really don't have anything special to talk about um, for, this, uh, for this application. Rohit, back to landscaping again. What um, this this uh, rendering is this drawing is quite lovely, um, but does it need to be evergreens, or is what they provided um, tall enough with enough screening? It does need to be evergreens. Um, there is a height. Uh, I need to check the coordinates. Um, but there is, a, there is a certain minimum height. I think it's six feet, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, if uh, uh, landscaping, if it doesn't seem to be six feet, then I need to make them uh, revise that landscape. But it does need to be evergreens. Could we then make a motion to approve it, assuming that they come to compliance with regards to landscaping like we did before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then I, given all of this, if there's no more discussion, I would like to make a motion that we approve this under the conditions that landscaping requirements be met. Okay. Second. Who, who was that the second? Who seconded? Yeah, right now. Okay, let me go back to the voting, voting screen here. Sorry, one second. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, all in favor? Unanimous. All right, unanimous. And Kelly, this doesn't have to go on the record, but I too, when I was looking over this, I was like, that is quite the drawing and that is a very <laughs> helpful rendering of um, the suggested plants. To go in the backyard that was that was more colorful than my backyard currently is i just want those coloring skills all right thanks everybody okay oh i need to, need to get i okay. forgot to call christina so let me let me do that i will say this very i'll i'll draw this out to give you time all right so um austin is getting christina on the phone um for a discussion and preliminary DRB review of new village hall elevations and timeline for construction. Hey, I'm just not sure. sure. Um, well, I can introduce the topic while they're getting on the phone. Um, uh, no, do you want to get on the uh, that? council had decided that they okay, want to uh, renew the village hall, um, the floor plan, and the exterior, uh, main, uh, mainly based on a recommendation of uh, our resident architect uh, who gave a much better. Uh, idea of a uh, drawing in this uh, in this case uh, the idea of the architecture uh, which the council liked a lot better so we did actually pursue uh, changing the facade and the interior and um, as an ordinance that I've attached in the packet um, all non-residential buildings require the review from the DRB so this is the first of maybe two or three meetings two um, that we'll have, that we'll be presenting uh, the concepts uh, for the new village hall design because we're also trying to. Um, Rohit, you've um, got a lot of feedback, by the way, and we've already got Christine on the phone. Okay, uh, well, let me just finish the one thing I'm saying. So, um, there's a. This is going to be like the first of a couple of meetings. We have to review the elevations and the, the materials and the landscaping, the site plan. But so far, we only have the architecture, and Christina's going to about um, what we have so far. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can, can y'all hear me? Can everybody hear me? Can you guys hear her? Yeah, there's, they're, they're giving you the thumbs up yeah, that you can't see. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she okay. can't see you giving the thumbs up because. Uh, I know phone. this is I know oh, this okay. is not the site specific plans. I just wanted to give y'all kind of a first initial um, opportunity to speak to, to talk about any issues that you may see with the current elevations that you have. You should have the front, back, and 
side elevations of what we are proposing it to look like, as well as, you know, the floor plans, which I don't think y'all have a lot of input into that, but just provided that just because we have it already. Uh, we just hired our civil engineer earlier last week, so we will have those, uh, the civil plans, the, the landscaping and all that stuff done within a, about a month, and we hope to get that back to you guys before your next meeting. But just wanted to kind of give you a preliminary look at the, the current elevation so that we can start reviewing that. And if y'all had any any suggestions on building materials or anything of that nature that you wanted to, to see, then we could go ahead and discuss some of that stuff. We are in a pretty aggressive timeline, so we want to make sure that we give, you know, all parties ample time to, to look at it, but we want to make sure we adhere to the timeline for various reasons. Primarily because we are seeking financing for this project, and the way the LGC works is they cannot authorize a approval until we get the bids back. And then when we get the bids back, which is supposed to be in sometime in March, the bids are only good for a certain number of days. So we need to make sure we, we move pretty pretty aggressively on this. So if there's any issues that y'all just see right now, let's go ahead and start addressing some of these things so we can get them uh, looked at. Or if there's any input again in, into materials, let's, let's talk about that as well. All right. Anybody have any comments, questions? All right, well, while they're thinking, um, I do have a question, um, Christina. I see there are handicap ramps in the front of the property, but will, won't the um, parking be in the back? And I don't see handicap ramps represented in the back and the rear elevation. We're still working that out because we have to do uh, expansion on the side. So but if, if one of the requirements is to have handicap in the back, which I would think that it is, then we would make sure that take, that is taking place. All right, cool. Can we share that? Can we put that on the screen for yep. all of us? Yep, just one second. We'll pull it up. I, I could be wrong, oh. Kelly, but I think that handicap, we just have to write handicap accessibility on one end or the other. And if that's the case, then we may just do you know one side. But if it's required to be on on both sides, then we would do both. I don't yeah. know the answer to that for sure. Yeah, my my uh, concern is just um, you know if anyone has a handicapped parent or child, having to having to walk from the parking lot to the front of the building to access a handicap okay. ramp, I would just put it as close to the handicap parking as possible because that's that's where it's needed. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good suggestion. Yeah. I've got, you know, a couple questions, I guess. One is just, you know, first off, I really like this, you know, the elevations and the plan versus what, you know, what was on the board previously. And then the, the second story that, you know, that you see, you know, on the elevations, is that actually an open space above the um, chamber areas or is that just, you know, it for, is. for looks? It is. It is. It's a faux second story, so there's not actually a floor there. It, it does open up to the meeting room, so the, the ceilings will be elevated in that area. Okay, so it is a, a full height kind of thing there. Yes. Okay. You know, that, that, that will make that meeting area really spacious. Yeah, it um, will. Yeah. And, you know, it looks like lap siding. I'm, am, am I assuming something like a hardy plank or something? That is, that is the intent. However, the, the complete building design as far as the outside has not yet been decided, but from my understanding, that's the intent. Okay, because, you know, that being you know, said, yeah, I think it really fits in with the, you know, the, the heritage district. You know, it looks like it's, we have been there for since the beginning. There's been discussion of brick and, like, stone and that sort of thing, and I don't think that any of the council is interested in brick or stone at this time, so I think that it will be some type of hardy plank. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, they didn't use brick and stone, you know, in 18 whatever, or at least in, in Marvin. John, John, we'll, have okay, stuff, we'll have all that stuff finalized by the time y'all do your final review. Um, so I'll have more details on that once we get the final plans back. 
John, I would echo what you said. I, I think these initial drawings look really good. I like that uh, big open area with the full second floor. I do agree with the planking. I think there's probably quite a few types that an architect could come up with it would probably look good, but I'm not sure us to be real specific about what plank goes on it. This is probably needed or appropriate right now, but in general, I think it's a, a, a great concept drawing from my perspective. Yeah, I think so, you know, versus board and batten and some of the other things that were thrown around previously. You know, it seems more fitting for the area. Yeah. Um, Christina, I have a quick question. This is not quite about the outside elevation, but because of that opened um, meeting space, um, do you guys know how that's going to affect the acoustics of that room? No, I do not. That's a good question. We will have a separate AV uh, group come in and do most of the audio visual stuff. So if there's something that's needed extra from there, we'll have to, to add that into their bid. But that's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, if there's a if that's going to be like an echo chamber, instead of trying to fix it on the back end, I would just see if they could... I don't know, tilt a wall or something so that you don't get that kind of crazy, you know, that is yeah, gonna drive, that's yeah. going to drive everybody crazy. No one's going to want to be in that room, especially the council. Good, good, good point. But it's be it looks beautiful. Way better. Yeah, we're, we're really excited to move forward with it. And, you know, we're looking <laughs> forward to getting those final plans so y'all can go through it and look at them. I just, you know, wanted to emphasize the, the timeline. So if y'all had an opportunity to give input now on what you see, you know, I thought now was the time to, to do it so I could incorporate some of those things into the design. Yeah, what, what, how does the, I, I, know, I know that the floor plan is, you know, different than, than we had before. Right, I, I like the floor plan, but just curious, how does the size and, and everything in there compare to what, what was being in the works previously? Roughly so the same tried, or? We tried to keep the program the same uh, as far as, you know, how many uh, office spaces, how many, how much square footage. We obviously reduced the square footage slightly, but in order to uh, expand, we, we wanted to make sure we provided opportunities for future expansion when we needed it and so we've kind of developed these plans based on the perimeter that we can expand on those side wings as we grow and as we need more of the space or as we need you know future space for whatever reason we've kind of taken away that future expansion from the previous plans and just gave us the opportunity to grow when that time comes and we did make them you know, smaller uh, we, because we reduced the second floor, we were able to take out, you know, the, the place that we had stairs and the elevator and that sort of thing. Is the timeline uh, currently available for viewing? Do you have that that we could, we could look at that? I do have it uh, inside one of the previous agenda packets. Austin, if you can pull that up and show them. Yeah, you'll have to give me one second. I'll give me a minute to it. Now this timeline is, you know, changes slightly from, you know, day to day when we get updates on where people are on certain projects, but for the most part, it is pretty much the same, uh, what we have now. And we are, we are estimating the groundbreaking to be sometime around May, June, July. Okay. I mean, you're putting this out for bid, correct? Yes. It should go out for bid in March, early March. Kelly. It's not February. I can't remember the exact dates off the top of my head, but. How long did the previous, um, how long were the people given before on the previous building? Uh, on the bidding process? Yeah. Uh, initially, I think it was two weeks. And we had to go back out and rebid because we didn't have enough come in. So I think I think they had a total of maybe a month, month and a half. And with this process, I believe we gave them a month. How, how many builders have responded to the RFP and said they accepted the bid? Say, say that question one more time. How many how many bidders do we intend, anticipate getting? We have to have three. If we don't have three, we have to go out for a rebid, and that we can make a decision at that point. 
But by law, we have to have three. We will send it out. We'll send it out to several, though. I mean, last time we sent it out to over 20. We also put it on the state's uh, historically underutilized business. So anyone that had those underutilized businesses could bid on it as well. But we didn't get but maybe three or four bids. Okay, so just to be clear, what you said, it's that uh, March or what you said possibly February, that's for, that's for a set of plans that's uh, suitable for bidding to go out. Is that what you're shooting that for? Can, can you repeat that one more time? It's hard for me to hear you guys. I'm sorry. Mark, go ahead and ask that again, and I can, I can translate. I just was asking. I, I wanted to clarify that what you said earlier about the timeline. You said March. You said possibly February. So that's to get a, a full set of... Uh, Architectural and, and civil plans and everything that, that's suitable for bidding is that is that the timeline you're talking about? So, uh, Austin, do you have the the timeline pulled up yet? He's, he's I'm still trying on, to find I'm it. I'm working on. I'm trying to remember which meeting you last had it in the packet in. Yes, can you just pull up? Can you go into the V drive and pull up my documents? Sure. So that's probably. Yes, I'll tell you where it is. Definitely easier. Um, okay. So go into um, V drive manager, Christina. Yeah. Village Hall. Yeah. And you should see one that says 2020. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's the, the building plans. Though, um, you should see a timeline that says maybe timeline final. And the, the last day that I went into it was probably last week sometime. So that's the most. All right. He's I got got it. He's pulling I got it. I got it. I'm pulling it up now. Okay. One second. I got to switch over to another screen. You should see a section in February where it says construction bids go out or something something like that. Almost there. Yeah, I think I'm, can everybody see the Word document that's got the timeline in it? Yes. Okay, good. Yep. I was like, we can't. There we go. Okay, you're good, Chris Sands. Pulled up. When I can't see it, um, Austin, so you just have to work with me. Okay. Um, there's there's a section that says construction bids go out or construction RFP goes out, but it, it'll specifically say construction RFPs or bids. Hey, Austin, could you go back to ch sharing the, the TV screen? Because now that you've moved the Word document back to TV, you're just sharing the violence oh floor. Yeah, I'm not the most technologically liter literate person. Just one second. Well, there that sucks. It was so much easier. Oh, I didn't say that, but you can. <laughs> Chris, okay, hold on, almost there. Okay, we're going to try this one more time. And. Okay, there we go. Start in the February timeline and just look for that construction bid RFP. February 8th, banking RFP out the bidder. No, 2-2. Two, two. Well, right, right before that. Right before? Bank, yep. RFP. Oh, no, that's... Yeah, RF, oh, The banking, banking RFP? RFP bids. No, it'll say construction. There's two different RFPs we have to do. Banking... I mean, uh, construction, construction is the one... Construction bid opening 319? Yeah, but when when does it say that the con, the RFPs open up? Oh, it's in February two, two twenty two twenty two. 222? RFP for construction and okay. RFP for construction is two twenty two to three three nine. Okay, so the, the bid opening is on March nineteenth. Is that right? The, the bid opening is the, is March ninth. March. Okay, so then we have two weeks slated to for bids to go out, which we may need to extend that some. You you are going to need to extend that. I believe. Totally agree. In, in this construction market, if you want to get legitimate contractors doing real serious bidding with like rolling up their sleeves, being ingenuitive, value engineering, getting good pricing, you're gonna have to give at least at least three weeks. Yeah, and we can we should be able to push that up. As long as we've got the plans in our hand and y'all have approved them, I believe that I've slated for y'all to it, it has the last date that I hope that y'all Give us approval. What date is that, Austin? Mm. Is it the February meeting? Design review or board final recommendation is February 16th. Okay. So if that's the case, then we're going to have to, if we need to extend the bid 
process. There's no way that I can move up y'all's final approval unless y'all do a special meeting. Um, and so if we need to extend that bidding time, then we're going to have to extend the, the process just a little bit longer on our end, which could be affected by LGC as well. So it's just there's so many different moving parts to this. It's, it's really complicated, but... Well, I, would, I would just, my, my one comment would be, you know, this this has been dragging on in various forms for years. Uh, to cut a week off the quality and, to, and jeopardize the quality of the bid responses to me is just uh, not a very not very good foresight on our part if we go down that, you know, tell them then to, to make that make it a big rush emergency for the building yeah. and the subcontractors makes no sense. So I understand. Planning board, would we be willing to hold a special meeting to get final approval, depending on when Christina needs us to, so that she's not dependent on us doing it on two sixteen? I don't know. I mean, is is there some is there something special about having to break ground in May? I mean, May, June, July, August—they're all very good months to. I mean, as long as you're not breaking ground in December, January, February, you're fine. I mean, what's the the problem? The problem that we're going to have is the LGC is going to approve our financing based on a certain date and that date is static we can't change that date um we could move it back if we wanted to but we already have a third party financial advisor that's working on everything that's needed for that project so it's going to be nearly impossible for us to move that date and that's all bound by the lgc's calendar and once they give us approval those bit they will not give us approval until we actually get the construction bids back so we have to have those construction bids back before that LGC meeting. And then once, typically construction bids are only good for six months based on you know the cost of material. Contractors typically do not want to push out any more than six months is what we've seen in, in our previous experience. So by the time we get the construction bids back and what we're estimating now, March, we are estimating LGC approval in April and we would have to award those contracts subsequently, but y'all would have to have the approval on the plans before we can even go to LGC because we don't know what we're bidding on at that point. Does that make sense? I'll take your word for all that. And I would say if it, if it takes a special meeting to have the project run smoothly with the contractors are gonna bid and build it, then we'll have a, we should have a special meeting for an hour or two or whatever it is. seems to be on board with that I will tell you that I hope to get the plans back before I have um, put in your in this calendar here I actually hope to have them back pretty quickly and if that's the case y'all may even have them at your January meeting and you can go over all the final detail at that point in time but um, and that would still allow us to go out for bid longer than what we had initially planned so if everything works out well then, then that would take place. Uh, I'm just worst case scenario on this timeline is what I've kind of planned out. That sounds good because I was concerned that you weren't going to be able to get, you know, plans completed by, you know, February, you know, bid documents. Yeah, the bid documents are pretty much done. I mean, we did it the last time with the last plan, so there's not really a whole lot of changing that has to take place with that. It's just really the, the detail sheets and the, the civil site plans and that sort of thing. But we've already started working on a new survey. Our civil engineer was hired last week and he's pretty expedient with his process. Um, and then our, like I said, our, our engineer was hired several months ago and they should already have all the building plans in AutoCAD now. They're, they're just ready for the civil to go ahead and finish his work up. Well, good. So, so what, what is our charge here tonight? Just everybody to be able to, to, to kind of air their thoughts and uh, then just capture them and then sort of move move forward. Yeah, I wanted to just have y'all go over these one one initial time because I know the next time you see them, you're going to have everything in your hands and it's going to be a lot of information, a lot of material for y'all to look through. And I just wanted to give you a first stab to see if y'all had any concerns that just kind of jumped out at you. If you had any recommendations on the building material or just anything that really was major that we needed to get addressed. And so by the next meeting, we'll have the final plan so y'all can go over all the, the questions at that point in time. Are the, the civil uh, plans, I assume, are not expected to change much from the last time we go around? They will, actually. Um, we are, we are, we've, we've reduced the footprint. 
So it's going to be a smaller footprint. We are planning to do just bare minimum parking and then have a overflow parking with permeable pavers. And this will reduce the total impervious area for um, the impacted surface. And if we get the land disturbance under an acre, we will not have to put in the BMPs, which would reduce the site work dr dramatically. Um, so it, we should see a reduction in the footprint um, and maybe the loss of the BMPs, which is, is good. And uh, the landscaping should pretty, pretty much be the same. Um, the parking would be reduced, obviously, like I just mentioned. And the, the, the concept of us moving the building closer to the road is something that we will discuss and talk about. So I, I see that you uh, awarded the civil engineering contract last week. It looks like on the ninth. Um, Say again. You it looks like the civil, civil contract was awarded on the ninth, and you said he was a, a quite a, a efficient, quick uh, person. Yes. Yes. So what? I mean, because it. I mean, it, it seems like we could probably do this in two phases. You know, we could look at the civil stuff, and then in one meeting, and maybe look at the architectural the next. Like if, if, if we're going to have the civil, it sounds like we could have the civil engineer stuff by January, right? Uh, I should have, actually, I should have the, the architectural plans back before I have the civil. I can get the okay. architectural plans pretty quickly. Okay. But if y'all want to break it up into two meetings, I'll get the architectural plans first, and then we can add the civil on, onto that if, if y'all want to do that. Well, my, my only thought there was if we get a piece of it in, let's look at it and not wait for both pieces, whichever's first. Okay. Well, I mean, since, since it seems to be a big hurry, I was just thinking what could be most efficient. Mark Peterson, problem solver. <laughs> yeah, I usually create. I'm trying to change my ways. <laughs> All right, anything else for Christina before we let her go? All right. Thank will... you, guys. Thanks, Christina. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye. All right. Moving on. Let's see. Where were we? All right. Discussion of Development Finance Institute. So DFI Progress and December Marvin Heritage District Strategic Plan Committee meeting. My God, that's a lot of words. We can add more. No. Let's just make a yeah. weird acronym. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of acronyms that I needed to uh, in include, but because we need to talk about, we, we just need to you know, include them in the agenda. Um, so, there, so there are a couple things going on. Um, first of all, I guess I'll just say that uh, the December um, mini meeting, I uh, decided we, we could. Rohit, we can hardly uh, hear you. Okay, give me one second. You like you like fade out and come back in constantly. Austin, can you unscreen share? Yes, my apologies. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm okay, assuming well, everybody can see. Let's see right ahead now. Is that better? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. Great. Um, okay. So two. So I don't know how much anyone, everyone heard. heard uh, so I'll just start over because I didn't say that much. Um, so the December meeting of the strategic plan committee was canceled. Uh, because I wanted to let the DFI come back with at least a draft of the scenarios that uh, you guys looked at last meeting and uh, we presented to uh, them. Um, but uh, so, so we did do that. They just they got the scenarios about a week ago and they're starting to plug it in. Now they're really starting to understand what we're looking for and plug it into their model. It seems that all three scenarios would be feasible, but they're really saying that the high development scenario may be too much density, but it's fine because even a low development scenario is probably going to be feasible. Uh, but again, this is that's just preliminary talks, uh, so I wouldn't take uh, take that and run with it. Um, but in in the meantime, I do I do want to quickly show you, um, and I'm going to share my screen in a second. Um, I am on my computer now. Um, I, I wasn't until just now. Um, so. Um, maybe I'll turn my video on. You can see my not pretty face either. But um, anyway, so this is what this is the, the map that I made for them with the, the three scenarios, and so you can really kind of start to visualize 
you know, what the areas are and the square footage and the few sheds. I did include a link to that in the map. Maybe, um, maybe some of you had a, ch a chance to explore uh, this, uh, this mind map. It's very cool, it's very interactive. I'm going to show you how it works by just kind of navigating through it. Uh, you all can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, so over here, it kind of works like any GIS application where you have layers and you can click them on and off. Um, so there are some other layers too, like unbuildable area, and I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, we have the three scenarios here, the low, medium, and high. Um, you can even like turn them on top of each other to see what they look like if you want. Um, and so you can really see what the view sheds look like. You know, that's an 85 foot view shed there. Um, and, it, and it'll explain it. You can click on the map and you can explain this. And this is just as interactive as if you were to uh, click on the link yourself. Uh, so that's a 50 foot buffer. And I really, I really took great efforts to make every polygon descriptive of what it is. In the next meeting, I really hope to show you guys you know, real, like, real examples of what, uh, you know, those buffers really entail. Uh, ooh. Rohit, did you say that DFI has already, they already got their scenarios, they got, they've already put the scenarios through the model, or are they still working on it? Well, they just started. It's not like, a, here are the scenarios, plug them in and go kind of thing. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts, apparently, and uh, the uh, ability to, uh, to do this project is determined not just by these components, but a lot of other things uh, that I didn't ask you because they're kind of fixed, like street gate uh, cost is kind of fixed by NCDOTs, uh, pricing for things, and water and sewer, it's also kind of fixed by Union County's public works. Uh, one second, my, uh, my screen froze, so I want to see if I can uh, refresh. <coughs> Um, but I guess the point is, the point is that we've, we're making a lot of progress uh, to, to judge whether this district is viable and they're going to look at a lot of things, right? They're going to look first from the developer's perspective. You know, if we ask too little, will developers be able to build it? And they're going to look for the viability a little bit uh, from the market perspective. Like, is it enough? Um, is it too much? Um, and so I, so I just wanted to show you that this is what we're working with. Quickly explain also that um, for the commercial densities, we are really only looking at um, the eligible area. So, for example, this uh, this three parcel combination is 11 acres, but for the amount of um, commercial they could fit, we would only use the four acres. So, four acres times 0.25 floor area ratio gives 43,560 square foot of commercial. You know, building space in the high development scenario, and, and you know, DFI is coming back and saying, you know what, that is pretty high. I mean, as far as developments go, that's normal, but for Marvin, that's pretty high. You're going to be talking about, you know, that's going to require some strips, some two stories, and you know, that's too much of a departure from uh, um, what we're envisioning. Then we're just not going to go with the high density scenario, mm -hmm. even though it would technically fit. Um, the low density scenario is also around 3.6 acres, but uh, they would be allowed basically half as much square footage um, in this purple area. So you'd have the view shed, the purple area with the commercial of 23,000, and that includes an existing building. We hope that they record. And then in the back here, you have eight acres because we're using 0.8 units per acre for the low density scenario. Uh, that eight acres would have to fit on this uh, one, well, sorry, eight units would have to fit on 1.5 acres. Um, and so, I mean, if you could fit eight single family houses on 1.5 acres, they would just have to be allowed to be a little closer together. Um, and so looking at Scott Lett's property, there's, there's a concept where um, an Ardrey's property to cut out the unbuildable area so that we already know what we're working in advance. I mean, obviously, um, you know, you could, you could, if you didn't look at the wetlands, you could build all the way out here. Um, but, you know, we've been told by um, some of the people who live in Meadowwater, as well as uh, Scotland itself, that, you know, there's no chance of building back there. So just already account for the fact that whatever allowance we give him would only be allowed to be built in this area that I've drawn here. So now we're looking at 20 units on nine acres. Um, and so we already know in advance, yeah, we're probably going to have to I mean, fit the houses closer together. 
but uh, recognizing that uh, it's 26 acres, so today he could build 26 houses. But in, in a 0.8 acre, 0.8 units per acre allowance, he'd only be able, allowed to build 20. He'd be able to build them on that nine acres, and then all this area in the back would be um, unbuildable. Um, up on the right side, we do see that there are some exceptions because obviously Will owns his house and built so close to the road and not to be bothered. Right, you broke up um, a little there. You no, know, it's okay. Okay, how's that? How's that? I keep forgetting. You're good. Okay, okay. Um, so his house is a little closer to the road, so we'd have to allow that to be, you know, where it is. Um, and so, and so is the case for the current uh, Scott White's house. Um, you, I mean, to keep the character of Marvin, you'd have to allow those to be where they are, even if the allowed view shed is much greater um, for new developments. Um, mm -hmm. That's just a, that's a concept. Um, and I, I really think that um, that kind of uh, uh, explains everything on here. I don't want to go into. I don't want to really describe every property. Um, in detail because uh, the link is in the packet there. Um, I believe it's clickable, um, but if it's not, you can you, you can use the short link that I provided um, and just kind of explore this for yourself and you know start to understand um, you know how much can fit on each property based on the scenarios that um, <coughs> yeah, and finally I will uh, I really do hope to provide more like <coughs> drawing like more visual um, you know, representations of this square footage at a, you know, maybe the next meeting. Well, <clears throat> yeah. question? Yes. I thought I, I thought I understood, but maybe I don't now. <clears throat> In calculating uh, allowable buildable area, you know, commercial, uh, at whatever FAR we're talking about, and we've, we've thrown it out because I don't think we've ever even officially, you know, agreed on 300 feet of depth. Well, let's just use that, that number. Uh, so does, does the view shed, whatever we, does that not count in the, the square or the acreage for the FAR for commercial or is that excluded? Or is that something we have to decide? Um, well, nothing really decided yet, and I do understand that we haven't decided officially on that 300 foot depth. But it's really, it, it's a really good depth that captures, you know, where you can fit buildings, the parking, the stormwater uh, for commercial uh, uses. Uh, so we're just kind of going to go with that, and if we need to change that in the future, everything is everything. Cool. Um, but yes, it would. The acreage does count the view shed. As part of the acreage, so the, three, the full whatever acreage is within 300 feet of the road is counted towards the eligible acreage, but the commercial buildings and parking and stuff can only go in the purple. Yeah. So you, okay. so, yeah. So you see how I've wrote, written in the comments here the 2.3 plus 1.3. So that's the 2.3 you can see down here, and then this is the 1.3 that you can see down here. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the view shed counts with the acreage, but it's only the commercial everything is only allowed to be built in the first. Hey, Rohit. Yeah. That that um medium density, the yellow area you are about to hover over uh, around the lake. Mm. The part to the right of that little pond. Mm. How, how would if that was developed? How would they even access that? That yeah, that is a really uh, that is really problematic. Um, I've talked to that property owner, and there is uh, there are, there are a few options, and none of them are really great. Um, you can't really build in the back here. Obviously, um, one thing I didn't mention is that in our, our current ordinances, you can build roads, driveways, um, and even stormwater, and in some cases, the, the public open space in the buffers. But um, in this case, there is kind of sensitive. Uh, and environment there. So it's going to be very unlikely that they'll be able to build a road 
back here to where I'm drawing right now. Um, I think uh, either they're ooh, what did I do? Um, either they're going to have to uh, kind of forget about the idea of building back there, or they might have to ask banks for a driveway easement. Um, but whatever happens is not really. Um, I mean, not really. I mean, I have to think about it, but um, we don't really have to make any decisions at this time. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, long story short, none, I mean, none of the options are really good. They may end up just building in the, the, the front area here, putting all eight allowable units in that area, which is maybe one one acre, but it's, I mean, it's doable. Single family houses um, kind of measure them out, like in, in like the Waverly um, area. There are single family houses decently sized, um, just closer together, almost no yard. Um, and, you know, eight houses can fit on an acre. Um, we even have that, you know, here in Marvin with those uh, Amber Meadows and Courtyards, of course. Um, I keep mentioning that if we don't have more than one unit per acre, then they don't need to be age restricted. But that's the kind of, you know, single family style housing that could fit, uh, you know, and it can exist and currently exist in Marvin. If that was turned into, say, a park or something, I mean, they did talk about that too. Like, if they were to fit all their residential allowance in the front, they would be willing to uh, consider that back area for a park, and it would really just tie into uh, the preserved trail that already goes back there. So, you know, like I said, there are some options on the table, and um, you know, they're aware this particular property owner does, you know, want to see this vision, uh, this, uh, you know, this heritage district vision. They are really um, on board with that. So, we'll have to figure out what is possible. Um, but see, this, this visualization really kind of brings light to those kinds of issues, right? Because with the 100 foot buffer, you, you know, you don't realize that, you know, this kind of the allowable residential area is divided like that. So this is kind of just a start of, you know, figuring out the different, you know, issues that come up when you try to, um, kind of develop a, a formulaic, um, zoning district that is supposed to apply to all properties you now. There's, there's only like 20 property pieces. We can have brainstorm issues to all the individual solutions. And many of the purple areas, like, just, they're so, like, spaced out. There's, there's not a lot of connectivity. I mean, that's really just where the commercial stuff would be allowed to be built, but on the ground, there is going to be, they're, they are really going to feel a lot closer because there's going to be sidewalks, there's going to be street space, open spaces, you know, the public open space is like a really big idea and that's why there's so much room in between because that's where we're going to fit a lot of the public open space. That could go up to the road in a lot of cases. You don't really need that, that part to be, you know, 85% set back. Um, some cases, I'm not saying that, you know, kids are going to be playing up against the road. Um, what I'm saying is that some of the public open space could be in this new shed, and, then, and at the end of the day, this district will be a lot more, more cohesive than the public area to work. Um, yeah, Brett, that, that was to my question. Where are you uh, expecting to have the public open spaces? Um, they would really, they could really go anywhere. There's not a designated um, area that they have to go. Um, I mean, it, it really depends on the property and the property owner. Um, what they're able to do. Um, it could go in some places in the view shed, it could be in the commercial area, it could be a combination of commercial and residential area. Um, but uh, we really don't know until um, this, the site owners, the property owners really develop more of a site plan and figure out what they want and where things could go. So when when um, when do you think that uh, the DFI will have their report? Are we muted? No, we're not. No, he can hear us. Ruth, we can't hear you. Okay, 
Um, so I hope that they will uh, present uh, a draft at the beginning of January and the final report at the council's January 28th work session meeting. So will we get a copy of it at the same time or before or after? Um, I would hope that uh, I could also present that draft to both the committee and the planning board uh, before their final touches and present it to the council. Cool. All right, anyone else have any comments, questions? Interpretive dance? <laughs> All right. No. All right, moving on. Although you guys have missed Austin coming through these curtains over here, it's been just a show. <laughs> All right. I want to say that, so I, I do want to come, I like the map a lot. Good job, our uh, brother. Thank you, thank you. Um, and, and it's interactive, like I said, so you find the link in the agenda, and uh, click around and explore. And there's a lot of different layers too that you can explore. Existing houses, possible road connections, um, you know, natural areas. So there's a lot to explore if you find that link in that agenda. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. Moving on to discussion of Union County 2050 Comprehensive Plan and public input. Solicitation. So was this what, was this last week? Um, yeah, this is the last week. So uh, just to back up a second, because I didn't put a memo in this uh, for this item, but there is a link that you click and you'll see that uh, the county is working on their comprehensive plan and uh, uh, public comment period ends at the end of the week and they're really trying to push uh, to get as many comments as they can. And this is, this is relevant to municipalities too um so i'm just gonna uh let's see the comment period goes through december 18th which is this friday and i want to uh, just kind of quickly uh you know go through their uh you know their feedback tool the link is in the agenda um it's right there next to the agenda uh item name um and and so let's go through this real quick um, so this is their uh, feedback tool. Um, they there is a quick video here, um, and I think this will this will do the best job. Um, I think uh, summarizing the 2050 comprehensive plan. I think as a planning board, you, you guys ought to know what they're up to. So I'm just going to go ahead and play that video. I don't, Rohit, I, is this going to play well through WebEx? If not. Uh, a lot of times video sounds garbled through WebEx. I want to make sure we're not going to deafen people here. All right, all right. Then let me start playing it and tell me, tell me how it goes. How it goes. Uh, wait, let me, uh, let me see if I can share the audio directly instead of through my speaker. Okay, let me just start playing it. Tell me how it goes. Okay, is that, does that sound garbled or does it sound right? I heard nothing. You heard nothing? Oh, jeez. Okay. <laughs> um, hmm. Nothing here either. Why don't you just do a voiceover and, like, hum a little tune? Um, sure, why not? Okay. Bro hit Mariah Carey this thing. No, not those high notes, though. That is painful. Oh, I can do it. <laughs> Whoa! Challenge! <laughs> the Marvin <laughs> Planning Board Karaoke Night. <laughs> okay. Project is called Union County 2050 Plan. This is Archie Morgan. He's the chairman of the coordinating committee. This is an overview of the plan. Two minutes. Um, quick drill down. Mm -hmm. Increased stormwater regulations. Mm -hmm. Well testing for new homes.
and flexibility for development in rural areas. Increase open space requirements for some reasons. Closing the donut holes. Uh, the idea that uh, the county would allow some areas to be regulated by the, the municipality. That's a really pretty roundabout there. It's a different roundabout. It's also pretty. Mm. Believe it or not, there's large parts of the U.S. that don't have Let's get people fiber out here. Something. Get out of the rural areas and nothing. We can get cell reception. I can't do this in the house. We have to get online. Oh, big instrument for music. Y'all are able to see the subtitles, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, I was going to tell you, but I just decided to let you talk. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thanks. Okay. Um, that pretty much explains uh, the, the, the plan in a nutshell. And if you go to this link, I mean, I would really, I would really um, encourage all of you to submit comments. Um, <clears throat> they're really looking to have a lot, and then you know, tell your friends or whatever. Um, because there, there's concepts here. Um, you know, some of them do only affect the, the unincorporated county, but a lot of them do affect the, all all properties in the county. Um, and I'm not really going to go through this matrix one by one, but basically, uh, I'll just explain what, what's going on in this picture here, which is that there are five committees, and then there's a coordinating committee. And that coordinating committee uh, required a 67 percent approval for things uh, for these each of these things to go to go into the plan. So. If in the coordinating committee column there's less than 67 percent, it's not going to be included in the plan. So you can see in this uh, questions column all the, the issues that they talked about and what's going in the plan versus what's not. Um, so things like the cluster allowances, that flexibility for where water or sewer is present, um, school siting requirements that you know um, they talked about in that video, transition zones for donut areas, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the idea that in transition zones, the county would not um, consider any upzoning, which is like a rezoning that would in increase uh, the intensity in the areas that are completely surrounded by a municipality. Um, and um, so well testing on existing homes didn't pass um, because the citizens thought that would be a little too intrusive, but uh, well, uh, I mean, well testing on new homes did pass. Um, so anyway, this is the final draft. It's not a, when I say past, I mean what got included in the final plan. Uh, so is there any questions so far? Okay, um, I'm seeing some, some, and nine. nope, okay. So we'll talk about map. This is their future of land use map. Um, it's kind of difficult for me to do there. Okay, so in this legend here, uh, we'll see that we're um, we're on the left over here, um, and so the green areas are from what they call zones, and Martin and Wellington were kind of griping that we didn't really get any transition zones uh, that much. Um, but I think that's kind of the opportunity for you know us to us, I say, Martin uh, and Wellington residents to you know provide comments. Um, you know, there's there's been a lot of uh, comments. You know, people say, "How can you allow townhomes in Marvin?" Uh, well, that was in the county. Um, you know, so the, this is this is really the area to look at. This future land use map is not it's not that you know you guys worked we worked on our future land use map. So it's not that those properties would be rezoned to this when the comprehensive plan passes, but rather that when rezonings are um, you know submitted to the county. They would refer to this map and say, okay, if it's in the green zone, you're not allowed to have that rezoning unless you ask the municipality. If it's in the yellow, we consider up to um, one unit per acre, but if there's water and sewer, then they would consider two units per acre in the yellow zone. 
and the orange zones, uh, sorry, the, the like the orangey orange zones are where they would consider higher density residential. And this is kind of where the uh, this is another comment and you know, if you want to a higher density residential, you know, the county is considering that um, in these two locations from Providence Road and then find that these uh, neighborhood centers, uh, this community center is obviously already built and then this neighborhood center here um, is mostly built as well. Um, but they're basically economic centers for commercial activities. And um, in other areas, they have really large uh, community centers and this economic uh, quarters where they think that they'll have commercial all along 75, all along 74, and that, you know, that would be um, for them. Uh, um, but to their future land use map, final draft, um, any questions on this? Just, just I don't have any. Looks, oh. looks interesting. I think you're right. We need to probably spend some time on it ourselves. I, I have a right, question right. about the historical. Why is this so broken up? Like, um, because the gray areas are the municipalities, and the county does not have development regulation in the municipality. Those are the donut holes. You're yeah, about. yeah. I'm just surprised that the municipalities don't not only have control over those like yellow areas but they they, they aren't in the municipalities like it's just so annexation right, right. is mostly voluntary now the state stripped the way municipalities power to really effectively annex and uh and etjs yeah. are regulated by the county and we don't have any right so every colored area that you see on this map is in the county unincorporated county um and so you know the, the marvin is over here uh, this is Weddington. I hope you can see my mouse, otherwise what I'm saying doesn't make sense. This is Waxhaw over here, Wesley Chapel is the gray area over here, if I think that's why, you know, there's this donut hole in Wesley Chapel and the county is willing to give them that practice as well. Um, but we really don't have that much of donut holes, which is why when I, you know, when I presented that idea of ETJ, you know, consisting of our entire annexation area, it didn't really make sense, because uh, a lot of that was developed and it's not really a donut hole. So. Seems like the county wasn't going to be willing to give us that anyway um, as a transition zone, but that doesn't mean that you don't, you know, leave feedback if that's what you want. Um, because I think uh, the Weddington uh, folks are really uh, pushing to uh, uh, get people to leave feedback that they want transition zones in uh, a lot of the areas that are yellow right now because, uh, you know, people aren't really interested in seeing that, uh, that two units per acre um, adjacent to them. Um, and this, uh, you know, these high, higher density residential areas that aren't really defined, um, but uh, they don't. The Wellington folks are really not, not happy about that either. Um, anyway, so that's that's really why um, it's important that you know I'm presenting. Rohit, we can't hear you again. Okay, okay, sorry. I keep, I keep like leaning away from my computer and forgetting that. Just keep reminding me, sorry. Oh, I will. <laughs> well, you're fine, you're fine. Okay, um, so here's the plan in this fourth tab. Uh, it's, it's this link right here. I'm not going to click it right now, but you know, you can read the whole plan right here. Okay. Then finally, do a simple uh, feedback form. Uh, uh, um, that, uh, that you can provide your info, what do you like, what do you not like, uh, kind of deal. Um, it's in the so that's, that's it. Um, their uh, for comment period again ends this week, so uh, don't miss your opportunity and uh, you know tell a friend. They're really hoping that they get, even if it's negative comments, like people are upset about things, they want more feedback because that makes for a better plan. So. Um, that's all I have. Um, that's, a, that's a lot to digest in a short amount of time, but is there any questions about that? None for me. That was a good overview. Very good. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Sorry, where was that map again? In, in the, on the website? Uh, 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 um, you click that link. Yeah. That was incident. You click the link and then there's click here to learn more and provide feedback on the draft plan. I'm, I'm highlighting it. Yeah, perfect. Free. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Yep. That's a link. Thanks to hear. All right. Any other comments, questions for Rohit? All right. Review action items. Do we even have any? I really don't think we do. Rohit, do you have anything? Um, no, uh, I guess this might be the opportunity to follow back up. You know, last time we talked about form-based code, I really want, again, to come back with, like, some really clear, um, drawings. Uh, so I don't have anything for you today, but I hope to have all of that, you know, in conjunction with, you know, the visualizations of the densities. I think that's kind of like a, kind of knock two birds out in one stone, uh, effort there. So I'll, I'll hope to have that at a subsequent meeting. Uh, drawings of of uh, form based code planning. Yeah, yeah. Form based code would be the idea that uh, no, you know, yeah. we regulate largely and only really by the the look, um, and and so it has to be really clear to people. You know, we don't officially call out a density, but we do de facto regulate the densities by allowing a certain building size and a certain setback that limit the amount of, you know, density, square footage that a property can have. <laughs> um, of course, uh, I think it was Michael uh, that mentioned at the last meeting that Marvin Gardens is kind of an example of a form-based code. Um, but it's not officially a form-based code. It's just kind of some sort of hybrid. And we might be doing something like that, too. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think we're done with that. Um, so it's some sort of hybrid uh, that Marvin Gardens was, and it did result in a very specific uh, look that we decided in the beginning, and I have the architectural plans in my office, and when it was still a wooded site, and that's exactly what got built. So that's really kind of what form-based code accomplishes, um, and so I just really want to have some, you know, some sort of preliminary drawings so you can really see what, you know, a form-based code would look like. Cool. And when did you say you wanted to have that by row hit? Um, I'll just say, I, I don't really have a deadline for that. I'll, I'll just say at a subsequent meeting because uh, it is a lot of work and I really do want to do it. Um, and I'm going to be getting a planning assistant soon, like I did mention last time. So, um, let's, I mean, it might be January, it might be February. So let's, let's just keep it on your radar. It's coming in a future meeting. All right, board member comments. Uh, Mark Peterson. Uh, none for me, thank you. Melinda. None for me, we'll see y'all in 2021. Fingers crossed that the world steps it up. Here's, here's hoping to next year. John, are you feeling okay? Comments from you? I'm here <laughs> and I appreciate you taking over. Um, and, I, I'm, today is, is one week from surgery, and compared to the, to the first surgery, I'm amazed at, at uh, how quote, well I'm doing. I'm not ready to get out and get in the race car or anything else, but, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing it. Matter of fact, I don't have any walking aids. When I'm out and about, I carry a cane with me just for a visual for everybody around me, but I'm walking without anything. You got, and, uh, you got a sore in that. The well, pain I have is, is incision pain. So hey, I'm real happy. And hopefully I can get my, my mental part back by next month. <laughs> let, me know, let me know how you do that because I'd like mine as well. So, um, well, we're glad <laughs> that you are, uh, we're glad that you're healing up and doing well. And we expect you back in January. <laughs> and I'll be on the other side of the, <laughs> the table. All right, Kent. <laughs> Uh, nothing for me. And Michael. Mr. Lavelle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to uh, wish everybody a happy holiday. Be safe if you're traveling and uh, enjoy your families, and we'll see you next year. All right. Um, can I get a motion to... Do you have any comments? Oh, no, I don't have... I'm just glad to... Um, I'm glad John's doing well, and uh, I also wish everyone a healthy holiday. And if you're traveling, just wear your mask. 
Um, all right, motion to adjourn the meeting. At 8.28. At 8.28. Not so 8.29. Moved. There you go. Mark and Habit, I'll second it. All right. All in favor? All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody.